Welcome to Self Love Actually, a podcast that will provide guidance and support along your self love journey. I'm your host, Haley Curtis, a self love life coach who helps people better love themselves by creating a life they dream of living. My purpose in creating this podcast is that it allows you to love yourself a little more each and every episode. Today, we are getting into toxic relationships. How do you know if you're in one and what do you do about it? Taylor Chandler was the first person I thought of when it comes to dealing with toxic relationships. She's an expert on relationships and breaking toxic love cycles. I found Taylor on Instagram and was really drawn to her energy and authenticity. Taylor was the first life coach slash therapist I came across and really connected with. Not only is she a life coach and licensed therapist, she's also a certified health coach, personal trainer, dog mom, and so much more. I am so happy to have her on the podcast today because she is going to provide some great value. Taylor, welcome. Thanks, Haley. So why don't we just start by you telling us a little bit about your background? Yeah, I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. I'm a certified health coach. And I, before I was all into mental health, I was really into physical health. So health has just been a part of my life for a while. So I was a personal trainer for several years and I'm still a certified personal trainer and fitness nutrition specialist. So I spent a lot of time in that industry. Now I am almost all emotional and mental, but I'm getting a little bit back into the physical world. Very cool. Such a great balance of everything. Let's get into toxic relationships because you are an expert when it comes to toxic relationships. How does one know if they are in one? A relationship that is more draining, life draining rather than life sustaining is sort of a way I like to nutshell it. The reason why I like to just keep it simple is because when someone's trying to figure out whether they're in one or not in one, kind of get on this. I call it like the mental Olympics. Like, is it me? Is it them? What's going on? And so just to sort of, before we start to uh, assign responsibility for any of it, just noticing if you are more drained than reinforced, sustained, or supported is a good indicator that you're in a relationship that you could consider toxic. And are toxic relationships exclusive to romantic partners? Not at all. My clients will, of course, that come for about a romantic partnership most of the time. Most of the time. There's a small percentage that will start off with talking about like an issue with their parents. It's a small percentage. But I always say, because it's true, that if you're having like toxic dynamics in one area, you're having them in other areas too. I'm not going to say all, I'm not going to say all areas of your life, like at work and with your friends and with family and in your dating life, but it's never just one area. It's going to spill over into some other areas too. So toxic relationships can be in friendship. They can be in work. Um, They can definitely be with family members. I think those are some of the most difficult ones to identify, but it always starts in family of origin. It's much easier to identify the romantic relationship one. Plus, like just because social media and things like that, most people are talking about toxic relationships in the context of romantic relationships, but it can be in any type of relationship. And when it comes to toxic relationships, are there certain types of behavior to look out for? Yeah, I wrote it on a couple that I wanted to point out for you. Things to look out for in other people and things to look out for in yourself. So first, I'll talk about the ones you can look out for in others. Although this is not an exhaustive list, these are some that come up often. So here's one. Someone who doesn't have their own interests, okay, wants you to be a part of everything in their life. Um, These people can be seen as clingy. There are more obvious examples of toxic relationship patterns. And a lot of times people go for like these sort of like brazen behaviors, but it's Often not that. It's much more likely that there's going to be subtle things that end up turning into, that have big effects. 
So someone who um, doesn't have their own interests, hobbies, and wants you to be a part of everything is clingy. That can be something that ends up having a, this toxic dynamic. They become overly dependent on you. Another word for it is codependent. So they may not feel like they can have a happy life without you. And that's a problem. For some people that can feel like romantic at first or like, oh, this person's just so interested in me. But it's actually, you could call it a pink flag. So any of these things, nothing is useful without context. So any of these things alone is not enough to say you're a toxic person. So you need context. So I want to make sure I say that. But that's a pink flag. Here's another one. Uh, you think of this as like the other side of that coin, someone who doesn't want to integrate you into their life or decision. So let's say that they have a trip planned and they're going to Florida for the weekend and you've been dating for 30 days and you don't find out about Florida until they're in Florida. That's sort of a pink flag, right? Someone where that they don't integrate you into their life into kind of like basic things that feel like there's no consequence to you knowing, kind of basic information maybe about their family or friends, what they did that day. So it can feel like that there's walls um, and walls can be mistaken for boundaries. But if you're feeling like, hmm, I'm, I'm not getting, it's just kind of basic inconsequential information, that can be a sign that they're just trying to sort of keep you out um, of their life. So that's a sign that you might be entering into sort of a toxic dynamic. That can trigger someone to work for information that you shouldn't have to work for. It's something that, okay, like if I was meeting a new friend, these kinds of things would sort of just be out on the table. Why is it with this romantic partner or potential partner? Does this feel like I have to dig for information that in a normal circumstance, you wouldn't have to do that? Here's another. When conflict comes up or disagreements come up, they use sex or gifts to resolve the conflict rather than words. <laughs> Think of it like a dopamine flood. If Conflict is sort of like the opposite of like a dopamine rush. Like it makes you feel bad. It's more of a depressant, right? So if I'm going to try to cover that up with sex or gifts, things that make you feel good, things that are going to deliver those happy hormones, oxytocin, dopamine, stuff like that, we're using that instead of actually verbally resolving the conflict. So we might be, this is a pink flag. Someone who uh, isolates you from family or friends. With this kind of thing, it usually starts with um, a person being critical of people that you're close to. Um, you might have had friendships with uh, relationships with these people for quite some time, and you never thought that they were whatever, whatever, whatever. But now this person comes in and they have negative things to say about all of these people that are close to you that maybe you've never heard before or you never noticed yourself. And that could be a sign that you're being isolated, right? Rethinking relationships that have been enduring relationships in your life. And now you're rethinking them with this new person that just came in. Someone who's critical, defensive, minimizes your concerns or is invalidating. Those are kind of like more basic gaslighty kind of things that oh, I think a lot of people are now kind of opening their eyes to seeing that those kinds of things can be signs of entering into a toxic dynamic. That's quite a few things. and. As you're listing them, um, they aren't so obvious. Mm. You know, I could see where someone would justify their relationship when these things happen and blame themselves instead of really seeing for what it is. You know, mm -hmm. they may be so wrapped up in the relationship and focusing on what they can do to fix the relationship mm -hmm. um, where they don't even realize that it's not really about them. Yeah, exactly. So this is this makes like, untangling some of these relationships really difficult. A way to start to exit that fog, because a lot of people will define this as like being in a mental fog, because it is. It's, and it's really difficult when now you've grown this emotional attachment to someone. It's even more difficult to see that something is amiss. Usually like a toxic kind of relationship, someone has this gut feeling that the other person is getting away with something. And that's a very different feeling than, oh, I just don't, you know, I don't click with this person. That kind of like nagging feeling that they're getting away with something or they're getting something over on you. That seems like a really strong indicator that you're in something other than an incompatible relationship. Right. And that sounds like it would be more of like an intuitive pull or something that you feel... Mm -hmm. That could easily be dismissed too. Mm -hmm. So that's what makes this so difficult is that you're battling 
a lot of times by yourself and your head knowing these things that go on and justifying to stay in the relationship. Yeah, absolutely. Is it necessary to end toxic relationships or is it something that can be worked through? That's a question that comes up sometimes. Someone will call me and they'll say, they know that it's toxic. They know that this person is whatever. And they're like, well, can, can I stay in it? My question, I think the deeper question is, what is it about you that wants to do that? Mm. So when we're talking about like toxic patterns in yourself, that would be something that you would need to reflect on. Like, what, why would I, knowing all the, the writings on the wall, I know all these signs, I'm seeing all of this stuff. Why is my first course of action, my plan A, to stay rather than to try to figure out how to leave. <laughs> so that's a, that's a, you know, the question itself is a flag. The question itself is a flag. Is it possible? Yeah, anything's possible. Truly, anything, I think it, that it's truly possible for people who have an unhealthy dynamic to make it healthy. Yes. The probability of it is different than the possibility of it. So is it possible? Yes. Is it probable? Depends on whether the other person is in agreement that they have something to work on too. So both people have to be on the same page, understanding that, okay, we both have some unhealthy things going on. How do we handle, control what we can ourselves, come to the table and do something different? So it's just a very small percentage of like toxic couples that were both people at the same time are willing to do this with the same level of like effort. It's just not as probable. It's usually one person that's like, okay, I see what's happening. Let's do this. And the other person's like, I, well, I don't have a problem. So mm. we don't, we, there's nothing to be worked on in that. And I'll just tell someone, you would be wasting your money if you pay me to try to help you to do that because the other person doesn't want to do it. We would just be, I would be basically giving you like a script and it works where both people are in it, but if the other person's not in it, it's not going to work. So why is it essential to address toxic relationships in order to love yourself? There's no way that the scales are balanced in a relationship like this. And I'll also say that most people that are going to be listening to this and most people that follow the hashtags and most people that start to work with me or start to work with a therapist, a coach, whoever, most people are thinking that other people are toxic. Most people. There is a small percentage of people that, that are like, wow, I've had this whole history, and I'm pretty sure it's me. It's just like not that common. One of the reasons why it's so important to exit these things is to see yourself and your part of the cycle. If you have these toxic dynamics and patterns going on within yourself, it's literally not possible to achieve a healthy level of self-love. There's not enough space for it because we have these burdensome things that are still in you that have nothing to do with another partner. So something like you find yourself being indirect with partners, expecting them to mind read. You're dropping hints rather than expressing yourself. You might find yourself gossiping with your friends or your people that you work with about your partner. You might find yourself adjusting your life to accommodate someone else, dropping or canceling plans to make space for this other person. These are things in you that have nothing to do with the other person. Okay, these are choices that you make. And so exiting these kinds of relationships helps you to see, okay, yes, there are some things about other people that are truly not going to work, that are like negative influences in my life that someone else can bring in. But I need to be able to see what I have going on within myself that has nothing to do with this person, these things in me that would exist regardless of who I was with. It's not just David. Because if it was just David, I wouldn't have also done it with Jason. And if it was just Jason, I wouldn't have done it with Dave and then Mark and Brittany, right? So like to be able to see like what you're bringing, that's one reason why it's really important. Another thing is that when you're in these dynamics, regardless of who has the burden of responsibility of the toxicity, that's not the most important thing, okay? The most important thing is that you're in a deficit. So in these relationships, there's no way the skills are balanced. You're in a deficit and you can't be at your best 
from a place of an inner lack. So if I'm feeling like this person is taking something from me and I'm not getting filled back up, then I cannot produce or be as effective on the outside because inside I'm in a deficit. There's no use in having a mansion if you don't have furniture to put in it. Most people would say, I would rather have a shelter with one room and one bed than a shelter with two rooms and no beds. There's no point in having on the outside if the inside isn't filled up. And if you are in truly a toxic relationship, there's no way that your inside is being filled up. You're going to consistently feel like you're lacking something or something is being taken from you that you're pouring out and not getting poured back into. The other point that I would make is that who we surround ourselves with is how we get feedback about ourselves. And so if you are truly in a relationship with someone who is toxic, then you're going to consistently get negative feedback about you. In other words, I'm not good enough, right? I'm not doing it right. I'm not good enough. This is, you're wrong. Even the most confident of us can start to wonder if what they're saying or that if that feedback is valid or true, right? Because now you have this emotional attachment to someone. When we have an emotional attachment, we naturally want to trust them. And often we give them trust even when they haven't actually proven anything to us. It's that, that now we've become engaged with them. And so we just want to trust. So when we get negative feedback, even the most confident of us could be wondering, is this true? Because I believe you naturally. Because a toxic person always feels negatively about themselves. People that feel happy about themselves don't go around doing this kind of thing. They don't have this sort of effect on people. They don't leave people feeling confused. They don't leave people feeling less than. They don't leave people wondering about how you feel about them. People that feel good about themselves don't have that effect on others. So we already know that you're with someone who is more likely to have negative output that you're receiving. And so if we only get feedback about ourselves from people we surround ourselves with, I can't sustain a healthy, happy, positive view of myself if the person that I'm most intimate with has a negative view of me because they have a negative view of themselves. So I can't achieve that level of self-love I'm hoping to get, even when you have good intention, even if you're in therapy, even if you've hired Haley as a coach, you will not be able to sustain it if that person that you're most intimate with, and that can be a romantic partner or other people you're intimate with, close friends, family members that have these toxic dynamics, if you're constantly getting that feedback, it's literally not possible to get up there when you are consistently being like dragged back down. So it sounds like being in a toxic relationship is just super consuming and takes mm -hmm. up a lot of space yeah. that could be replaced with time spent on you, thinking about you, how to better yourself and love yourself. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, being surrounded by people who aren't the best for you isn't a great place for you to grow and really go beyond your point of self-love right now and really mm -hmm. flourish with self-love. So what would be your advice for someone who just feels stuck in a toxic relationship? The first thing that I would say is that you just feel stuck. You're not stuck. And there's a difference, right? Mm. So that's an important point. You feel stuck. You're not stuck. You do have choice. Okay. Some people can stop right there because they're willing to take their feeling as reality. I feel stuck. And so I am. And if that's where you're at, that's where you'll stay. So you have to be willing to confront that feeling. Say, I, it feels like I don't have an option but I know that I do. When it's kind of like, I feel stuck, I feel like I don't have a choice. You have to start taking responsibility for the choices that you've been making to stay in. And because you've made choices to stay in, that means you also have choices to get out. So you have to take responsibility for what happens next. Think about it like, okay, if you knew for certain that no one was going to save you, what would you do next? If you 100% knew that there wasn't going to be another partner that just came in and grabbed you from this one and that that person's going to be healthy and shine a light and tell you that you're so great and you never deserved it. You weren't going to get a partner like that. You weren't going to get a friend like that. 
You're not going to get a family member like that. If you knew that nobody was coming to get you, what would you do next? Everybody has an answer. Everybody has an answer for that question because it forces you to go into no other option mode. Like you, when, when you're in survival mode, you're going to find a way out. So sometimes people, we, we get so much into this kind of like victim mentality that it's like, uh, well, I know this is bad, but I just need the right therapist. I need the right coach to knock me. No, 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 <laughs> no. So are we helpful? Absolutely. Are we supportive? Absolutely. But there is nothing more vital than you. You have to move. You have to act. I mean, I'll tell people, stop paying me. If you want me to come get you, <laughs> like, don't pay me. Like, don't stop it. Like, if we're on session five, if you have done anything different, and, and this has turned into a vent session, and that's supposed, I can't help. You should stop paying me today. Let's not continue because it's not going to work. So you've really got to take responsibility for what happens next. So if, if you can't think about what to do next, think about if there's if there was no one else, if you can't get in touch with Haley, if you aren't going to hire Taylor, if you aren't going to go to therapy, you aren't going to read a book, what would you do? Do that. A lot of times someone knows that someone is like, you know, not great for their life. Let's just say that. Not great. So first start talking to me like they're going to be leaving this knight in shining armor. Like they, like it's just the man of their dreams or the woman of their dreams. I, oh my gosh, I just can't pull away. And I'm like, okay, make a list of all the things you, you're really going to be missing out on if you leave. And they're like, oh, uh, nothing, nothing. So what's happening, like when we're in this mental fog of a truly toxic dynamic, again, very different than someone that's incompatible than you. When you start to think about what am I really missing out on, you realize that it's just a fantasy and the hope of the potential of what you thought that this relationship was going to be, but it's not that. The reason why I brought up the incompatibility thing again is that when you're with someone who's incompatible, but a healthy person. There are things that you will genuine, positive things about them that you would genuinely be like, oh man, like that's really gonna suck. We always used to go to live jazz uh, in the park on Fridays and that was really nice. Uh, he always would help me study for my test and that was really nice. When you're with like healthy, secure people that you're just incompatible with, there are real things that you, that like your heart's gonna be like, oh, that was really nice. I'm gonna miss that. That's healthy and fine and a, even like a healthy grieving process of missing that person when you have to, when you realize that that relationship just isn't in alignment with what you want for your life. When it's like a toxic person, when you start to list out all the things you're going to miss, you start seeing if you're going to miss out on anything, it's a lot of negative stuff. You're going to be missing out on uh, arguing. You're going to be missing out on pettiness. You're going to be missing out on being blamed for things that you really don't think that you did. You're going to see that you actually gain positive things rather than lose positive things. Oh, you got your appetite. You're going to, oh, I might get my appetite back. I might start sleeping better. Now, I, all of a sudden, I might see that I'm, I have time and space for my friends. So that's a really stark contrast between like, okay, is this person toxic or is this person incompatible? Toxic, you're going to see that if you left, you would gain positive and you would lose negative. With incompatible, you would see more often than not that you would actually lose some positive things rather than gaining so many positive things back. Thank you for making that distinction because I think that's a really good way to kind of visualize it too of, you know, you're gaining positive and losing negative when you end a toxic relationship. And if it's just, you know, a relationship ending and y'all are compatible, you may be losing something positive too. Those are all of my questions around toxic relationships, but I do have some standard questions that I ask all of my guests. So what is your first memory of an act of self-love? My first one I would say would be in middle school where I played a lot of sports and I noticed that my dad was way more into basketball than soccer. Soccer was like my first sport and like my first love. And I picked basketball up and I was good at it, but I didn't love it as much as soccer. This must have been my first 
recognition of like people pleasing that I stayed in basketball for longer than I wanted to because I knew my dad liked it more and he was more engaged in the basketball games and the soccer games. I considered it for a while, like, what am I, am I going to quit the team? Am I going to stay on the team? And I just decided in the middle of the season to quit because I just didn't want to do it. I just, I wasn't as satisfied. And so I would say that's my first memory of choosing myself. <laughs> I just, yeah. of course, didn't have the language for it at the time. Yeah, that's interesting. You say you didn't have the language for it because with this question, like my answer is like a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Like It's just something that yeah. happened way later on in my life. So it's cool that you were able to identify that point in middle school for you where you chose yourself. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. So what is your current favorite self-love practice and why? My morning routine is like, oh my God, I like <laughs> my morning routine is my favorite act of self-love. This is every single day I wake up, I take my dog out first because Coco has a very small bladder, <laughs> very small bladder, very small dog. So after I do that, I do my meditation and then I read my devotional, I journal so I don't look at my phone or anything until I've, I don't open up the computer. I don't do any emails. I don't respond to anything until I've done those things. That's my favorite because it is so consistent and enjoyable. I mean, I really look forward. Like I wake up and I'm like, I get to do this. Like it's really, really good and grounding for me. It's something I can count on. It balances me, clears my mind, sets the tone for the day. You know, it's like one of those self check-ins. Like, okay. Where is my mind at? Um, it's not a planning period. It's literally just like noticing where I am and where my thoughts are so that I can be centered for the day. So it's definitely my favorite. That sounds amazing. I love a good morning routine. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, Taylor, those are all of my questions I have for you. Let people know where they can find you. Yeah, so on Instagram, I am Taylor Chandler. I am, I am Taylor Chandler on Instagram. <laughs> How do I say that? <laughs> I am Taylor Chandler on Instagram. It's the same as my site, I am TaylorChandler.com. And that's where you can find me. Um, I have a podcast as well called Boundaries and Grace. And you can reach out, DM, email. I'm here. Yes, y'all make sure to go follow Taylor and listen to her podcast because it is awesome. If you enjoyed today's episode, there is a lot more content about toxic relationships on Taylor's podcast. Thank you so much for listening, self-lovers. If you enjoyed this episode, please let me know by leaving a review and subscribing to this podcast. And if you really loved it, please share this episode with a friend. This episode wouldn't have been possible without our production partner, Pinto Media. Making this podcast has been so easy with their help. If you're thinking of starting a podcast on your own, check out their page on Instagram at produced underscore by underscore Pinto, P-I-N-T-O. If you're ready to level up your self-love game outside of this podcast, you can book a free clarity call with me to see if we would be a good fit for one another. I help my clients achieve their goals fueled by self-love. You can head to my website, HaleyCurtis.com or check out the show notes below. If you have any suggestions or feedback for me about future episodes, please email me at hello at HaleyCurtis.com or DM me on Instagram at I am Haley Curtis. I really want to make sure that these episodes best serve you. That is it for today, self-lovers. I will meet you again on our next episode. Mm -hmm.